Um, so you're there in uh, Psalm 37, and I want to preach a sermon uh, entitled, Fret Not, Fret Not. Now, um, what I want to really get into is the idea of having anxiety um, and kind of panic, you know, and, and a lot of people deal with this. You may not even realize it. Now, the root of that is fear, okay, and I preached a whole sermon on uh, fearing not or not fearing, not being afraid, um, but being afraid turns into panic and it turns into fretting about things. And, and so I want to preach on this because especially what's going on in the world right now, a lot of people are just, you know, panicked. They're, they worry about it, you know, kind of like fretting is, is to, to, to worry, right? And so everybody looks at what's going on in the world, their social unrest, um, you know, they're, they're worried about the, either the government, the police, or there's this, this racial division that's going on in the world, or basically everything's being polarized uh, by the media. Um, but everybody's worried about it. Um, I don't know how many people, t- you know, talk to us when we were out soul winning. You know, some people didn't necessarily want to talk about the gospel, but they're like, what do you think about what's going on today? You know, like with everything that's going on, you know, what's your thoughts on that? And so people are, are worried about it. You know, they're, it's just a, a lot to fret about, if if you will. But in in Psalm 37, when I think of fretting not, I think of this as the fret not psalm, if you will, because it says it so many times here. But look at verse 1 there. It says, Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut off like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land. And verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. <clears throat> Rest in the Lord, and, and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger, and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. And what it's basically saying here is that don't fret because there's evil people out there that are prospering. And they're prospering in the aspect that they're causing uh, evil things to come to pass, right? Wicked devices. They're bringing wicked devices to to come to pass. And you can look at that and and look at the news and everything and just get worried. You're worried about, you know, what's going to happen to your family. You know, know, before I had kids, I didn't worry about much of anything, (laughs) okay? You know, before I got married, I had a motorcycle. I had everything. It was just like, I didn't care. You know, just didn't worry about anything. But when you have kids, that's a whole nother realm, okay? And obviously when you get married, you know, you, you, you care about your wife and you, you worry about taking care of your wife and all that stuff. But it's a whole nother re- realm with kids because your wife's an adult, right? But your kids, they're completely dependent on you. And so this is a sermon, especially for parents, in a time like this where you're, you're more so worried about, like, if everything went downhill and everything fell apart, you know, Will I be able to provide for my kids? Will I be able to protect my kids? You know, that's the thing that I think about. Um, But what's the Bible say here? It says, fret not thyself. You know, it says, fret not thyself three different times in this passage. And it's dealing with evildoers, right? It's dealing with the fact that there's evil people in the world that are causing wicked devices to come to pass. And he's saying, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it because their day's coming because they're going to soon be cut off. And what he's promising is saying, listen, do good, trust in the Lord and do good, and you'll be taken care of. And this takes a lot of faith. And what it comes down to not having anxiety and not panicking is saying, you know what? The Lord is true as the day is long, meaning that if, if I'm going to trust him that he's going to take me to heaven and give me eternal life, guess what? I could trust the fact that in perilous times that we live in, and weird twilight zone times that we live in, that he will protect me and my family if I'm trusting in him, if I'm doing what he tells me to do, that that will be taken care of. And and especially because it doesn't seem logical because if you're trusting in the Lord and doing what he says, you are bucking the tide of the world, right? 
that means that you're not placating all the wickedness that's going on. That means that you're not actually going along to get along. Okay? You're actually going against the grain. Okay? And to, that seems like, hey, well, you're just kind of sticking yourself out there then to be a target. And you are, right? If you, if you preach the Bible, listen, you're putting yourself out there as a target in the world because as the world gets weirder, the truth gets you know, more hated. Okay? The truth is hate to them that hate the truth, okay? And people don't want to hear the truth. I mean, good night, people don't want to hear that there's only two genders. You know, a friend of ours had a, had a, a baby out in Washington, and he, he, uh, he mentioned that it's actually uh, against their policy to have blue and pink uh, little hats for the babies because they don't want to push gender on any of the children. I mean, that's the, the weird, twisted world that we live in. Now, do I really care what type of little beanie they gave my child? No, I don't really care, okay? But you know what they're doing with that. You know what they're trying to push in a hospital. And let me ask you a question. Do you want to be in a hospital where they don't even realize that there's two genders? Okay, that's a problem. You know, my wife, you know, is a clinical pharmacist. And listen, you know what matters is whether you're a male or female when it comes to medicine. You know, you know what matters? You know, that's a big deal. You know, you could die if they, if, if they, if you're saying I'm a woman and you're a man, they can end up killing you because they give you the wrong dose. Okay. And so I'm not a pharmacist. So I'm not going to go off on that realm there. But, you know, it's just weird, the society that we live in. And then you have all this polarization of, uh, you know, uh, black people against white people and just all this stuff that's going on today and it's all a bunch of respecter of persons is what it is okay people are respecting persons just based off their their the color of their skin or based off you know you know whatever rich or poor right because it goes into classism too right it's like well you have a lot of money therefore you must have oppressed somebody to get there well maybe God blessed you because you actually did the word of God you, you did what he said to do and he actually gave you money. And maybe you actually worked hard and actually, you know, went to school, actually studied hard, got a degree that actually mattered, right? You didn't get underwater basket weaving degree. You didn't get a liberal arts degree that doesn't mean anything in the real world. And you know what? Or you just went out and got a blue collar job. You got a welding certificate, right? You went through all the training to be a welder. And guess what? You can afford that nice house. You can afford that nice truck, right? And and they'll look at you and be like, you're privileged, okay? You know, check your privilege. Listen, you need to check your privilege at the door when you come in this church because you know what? It doesn't matter. I don't care if you come in here with a gold ring or vile raiment. I'm going to treat you the same. I don't care if you come in here with black skin, white skin, yellow skin, purple skin, you know, and people are just getting triggered. I can't believe you said purple skin. You're making it, you're making it sound like the color of your skin doesn't matter. Yeah, because it doesn't matter. And you know what? People are fretting about this, though. They're fretting about it because they literally talk on eggshells with people of a different race, right? It's just like, it's just this weird. And listen, I guarantee that people that have a different skin color don't like being talked to differently <laughs> than everybody else, right? It's like no one wants to be talked to at a different level, right? Everybody wants to be talked to at the same level, okay? And so... But that's the world we're living in today, and this sermon is really to show you, hey, listen, we need to not be worried about it, okay? You know what you need to do? Trust God, keep his commandments, do what he tells you to do, and everything will be taken care of itself, okay? You don't need, and, and what it really comes down to is that you need to turn off that news, okay? If you're watching the CNN, I don't know why anybody would watch that. I mean, they're, that's a joke, okay? You're like, well, I'll watch Fox. I don't know why you're watching Fox at the time, right? You mean faux news, right? Um, so there's a lot, you know, that you just need to turn off because you know what they're trying to do? They are trying to get you worried. You know why they want to get you worried? So that you'll tune in next time so that their ratings go up. So they can make money. Guess what? They make money every time you turn on that channel because they get advertisements. Okay? And so, you know what? It really comes down to is that I'm not going to let them force me to think about what they want me to think about, okay? Go to Habakkuk chapter 1, because I want you to get this idea that injustice, things that are, uh, that are being done wrong in the world, this is, there's nothing new under the sun, okay? So this, this stuff about uh, police brutality, okay? Um, 
injustice when it comes to people being tried and they get the wrong judgment, all these different things. Listen, that's been going on since the foundation of the world. I'm not justifying it. Obviously, it needs to be nipped in the bud. Police brutality needs to be nipped in the bud. Any, any cop that, that murders somebody should be tried for murder, right? And <clears throat> so I'm not, and listen, I'm not, I'm not for the police, okay? If you want my honest opinion. I'm for what the Bible says, that, that God set up judges and the, the judges would make diligent inquisition and the people, actually the people, the society would execute the judgment. Well, how are you gonna protect yourself? You know, if you don't have a, a sword, sell your garment and buy one. You know what? My response time at my house is going to be a lot better than any police could ever do. Okay? My response time is this. That's it. I'm ready to go. Now, if I wake up. Okay? Now, that's another story, right? Because sometimes I'm like in a comatose state. And so, but all that to say is that, you know what, you say, well, who's going to protect you? The citizens will. You know what all this is teaching us with, with the riots and the mayors that cause all the police to stand down when they actually should be doing their job? This is teaching us that, guess what, the police can't actually protect you like they said they would. And so, you know what, if anything, it's a wake-up call to say, hey, you know what, we need to be armed. We need to be able to protect ourselves. And you say, well, you know, are you, are you for defend, defunding the police? Listen, that's not my battle. You know what, if, if we had the police for the rest of my life, then whatever, right? That's our system of government, that's the way things are set up. And you know what, there should be checks and balances on the brutality, on the behavior of the police, that, that people are checked for, uh, you know, abusing their authority. Um, but ultimately, I'm not out there to pick it about the police and say, well, you know, if we did it according to the Bible, you know, you know but I would say that there's a better way, okay? Obviously, the Bible is always the best way. So if you want my true opinion, then do it the Bible way. If you want my true opinion, then the, the, the law of God is perfect. And therefore, you know what? All the moral law that's in the Bible, put that into to writing in our, in our state and in our federal government. That would be the way I would do it. But at, at the end, we live in a, a world that we live in. And so, you know, I, I'm not expecting that to happen. Uh, go to, uh, you're in Habakkuk chapter 1 there. Notice in verse 1, it says, The burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see, O Lord, how long shall I cry, and thou wilt not hear? Even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save. Why dost thou show me iniquity, and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me, and there are that raise up strife and contention. Therefore the law is slack. And, the, and judgment doth never go forth. For the wicked doth compass about the righteous, therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. And what I want you to get here is that Habakkuk was dealing with this. You know, wrong judgment proceedeth, that the wicked are compassing the righteous. And we see this day in, day out in America. And you say, well, what's the solution? Is it to go and, you know, uh, protest the government and all that? Listen, our government... If you want a lesson on 1776 a little bit here, when they set up the Constitution, when they set up the, the Declaration of Independence, obviously, and then they fought the war, they set up the Constitution, that they knew that this government would only work if you have a righteous people, right? No government will ever work perfectly because of sin, okay? I'll tell you what doesn't work, communism, socialism. Socialism, communism, you're like, oh, there's a difference. Yeah, socialism is that pie-in-the-sky utopia that ne doesn't exist, okay? Communism is what they've actually, you know, have in history, but to me, it's one and the same, okay? Because socialism will never happen. You know, what they, their, their utopia of socialism, it's impossible, okay? So what you have is communism. You know how many people have died under communism? A hundred million. Stalin killed... 50 million people, and most of them were his own people. Mao Zedong, you know, all the Pol Pot. You know, do some history, and you'll see that socialism doesn't work, okay? But all that to say is that there's no perfect government. You know what's a perfect government? When Jesus comes and rules and reigns for a thousand years. You know what? That's going to be a picture of a perfect government. And you know what that's going to be? A benevolent dictatorship. So, you know what? That's going to be a perfect government. What God set up with the judges, 
was the best that you could do with a sinful people, okay? That's the best could ever be, okay, with a sinful people. But he never wanted a king because he wanted God to be their king, okay? And so, but all that to say is that, listen, throughout history, guess what? Unrighteousness has been going on. Injustice has been going on. And so what, so this passage about fretting not, listen, that's in Psalms. I mean, that's back with the sweet Psalmist of Israel. You know, David is, is the one writing this. And so we're dealing thousands of years ago. Guess what they're talking about? Don't worry about evil people that are prospering, that are causing these wicked things to come to pass. Okay. Uh, and then in Psalm 37 here, uh, in verse 38, Psalm 37, verse 38. So I love this Psalm because it shows you, hey, this stuff is going on. But guess what? Here's the end game. The end game is that God will take care of you and that they, they will have their judgment in the end. Listen, all these people, you say, well, that person got off. Did they really get off? You think God, listen, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. So if you think that they're not going to get due justice by God, then, then you're saying that God's mocked by it. Okay. So we need to remember that, hey, if, if man doesn't do it, guess what? God will step in and take care of it. And, you know, they can say all day long, where is the God of judgment? Like it says in Malachi. And they can mock God and say, hey, he's not going to judge. He doesn't see. No, God sees it all. God is angry with the wicked every day. And so in Psalm 37, verse 38, it says, But the transgressor shall be destroyed together. The, the end of the wicked shall be cut off. But the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. He is their strength in, in time of trouble. And the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust in him. Now, in Proverbs chapter 24, it says kind of the same thing. It's kind of more of a abridged version of uh, Psalm 37. <coughs> but you kind of see uh, the beginning and end, if you will, of, of Psalm 37 here. So in, in Proverbs 24, verse 19... Proverbs 24 and verse 19, it says, Fret not thyself because of evil men, neither be thou envious at the wicked, for there shall be no reward to the evil man. The candle of the wicked shall be put out. There's your, there's your summary. <laughs> okay, what we're saying here is that don't worry about that. Okay? Now, when I say don't worry about it, it doesn't mean don't be prepared. Right? <laughs> you know, people say, well, you know, you carry, are you paranoid? Not at all. I am not paranoid at all when I'm carrying a gun. Like, why would I be paranoid? I'm prepared, right? I'm paranoid when I don't have a gun, right? I'm like, oh man, I should have brought that. Um, but the idea though is the fact that he's not saying don't be prepared or Jesus wouldn't have said, hey, buy a sword. So you gotta be prepared, but he's also saying don't worry. Don't be afraid. So you know why you're not afraid? Because God's with you, okay? Now this doesn't, just apply, you know, go to, go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. I don't believe that this fret not or don't worry applies to all Christians across the board. Okay? You say, what are you talking about? Because there's another prerequisite that's involved there. Obviously, a prerequisite for you not to fret is that you're saved. Okay? You have salvation. You have eternal life. Um, if you don't have that, guess what? You have plenty of reasons to worry. And it has nothing, you know what? And, and the things that are going on in this world are nothing compared to what you really should be worried about, which is hell, okay? So you can't say to an unsaved person, fret not. And so when we talk to people, and people will come up to me that aren't saved, and they'll talk to me, and they'll ask me, you know, like, hey, are you worried about this? I'm like, I'm not worried at all. But I don't say to them, hey, don't be worried, you know, because they should be worried if they're not saved. They should be, they should be worried to death about hell, okay? Now, I'm not worried because I'm saved, but notice in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, very famous verse here, Romans 8, verse 28, it says, and we know that all things work together for good. Now, a lot of people just stop there. All things work together for good. Not for everybody. And so you got to read the whole passage here. There's, no, there's not even a semicolon there. Okay? There's, you got to read passages. There's no punctuation to stop you there. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. See two things there? You're called according to his purpose, and you love God. Okay? So this is where it says, you know, he that loveth, um, he that loveth 
is born of God and knoweth God. Okay? Meaning this is that there's prerequisites. Hey, if you want to be the friend of God, or if you want to uh, perfect your faith, you've got to first be saved, like Abraham, right? It says Abraham believed God and was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Why? Because he did the works. Okay? So it's not, you know, if you believe on Christ and you have salvation, guess what? You're not the friend of God unless you do the works. And guess what? You're not going to, not, all things aren't going to work together for good for you if you're not loving God. Okay? Now, ultimately, spiritually speaking, you know, you're saved. Nothing can change that. Okay? But we're talking about you're, you're in this life or even the aspect of rewards in heaven and eternal value type stuff. You know, it's not all going to work together for good if you don't love God. Well, what's loving God? Well, in 1 John chapter 5, and there's other passages on this. You know, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Okay? But in 1 John 5, verse 3, it says this. 1 John 5, verse 3, it says, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. Okay? So when it's saying those that love God and who are the called according to his purpose, well, the called according to his purpose is that those are believers, okay? Meaning that if you believe on Christ, you're called, okay? But the loving God, that's something that you have to choose to do after you get saved, okay? And what is that? That's keeping his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous, okay? Go back to Romans. I should have had you keep a finger in Romans chapter 8 there. Romans chapter 8. Because you say, well, I want to not worry. I want to not be panicked about everything that's going on. You know, because people will literally have panic attacks. I think I remember hearing this, and you know, we laugh about it. You know, I laugh about it with people that tell me this stuff. But there's people that literally have psychi psychiatrists that they go to because they're worried about the environment. Like they're worried, like global warming has got them so worried. I mean, you've seen the videos where they're in the woods crying and begging the trees forgiveness. Now, those people are just completely insane. But there are people that literally are worried about the environment or basically the world just ending because of global warming or climate change, right? They don't want to say global warming because we have some of the coldest winters that we've ever had. But uh, so all that to say is that there's people that, that worry about things and you're like, that's silly. Yeah, it is. Okay. But you know what? You know what you find out a lot of times when you worry about something and you worry yourself sick about something and then it never happens? <laughs> You're like, man, I just lost like a couple days of my life worrying about something that never happened or wasn't even in, in the realm of happening. <laughs> okay? And so when it comes to these type of things, what you need to think about is th th this is how I deal with, with anxiety or worrying about things, fretting about things. Ask yourself, can you control it? And if you can't control it, why are you worried about it? Because if you can't change anything about it, nothing you can do about it. This can apply to your work, right? Because there's been times where just everything hits the fan, right? You're just like, everything's going downhill and the, the project's falling apart, right? And, uh, and people are just like running around like with their heads cut off. They're just like, what are we going to do? You know, how are we going to do this? How are we going to get this done at this time? Let me ask you a question. Is that going to help anything? By running around, worrying, yelling, like getting into like fights with people? Or is it just going to be like, you know what? It is what it is. We can't change the fact of what's going on right here. All we can do is work with what we got. Okay? So a lot of your anxiety, a lot of your worry will just go out the window if you just realize, hey, I can't control that. I can't control this. Right? I can't control these certain things that are going on. And, and especially with what's going on right now. Okay? Can you control all the riots and like the, the, the thinking process and the media that's pushing all this stuff. Can you control any of that? Then why, why worry about it? And so, and you say, well, I, and you say, well, I worry about people going to hell. Well, you can control that. Okay. And so I'm not, and that's not a worry. That's more of a, like a love, right? You, you love people and you don't want them to go to hell. And so uh, you're, uh, knowing the terror of the Lord, we, pers we persuade men, right? But see, you can control that, right? So that should be something that's on your mind that you're concerned about, okay? Your children, raising your children, can you control that? Yes, you can. So guess what? You need to be thinking about that. But all this stuff that's out in the world, and they're trying to push on you, be like, you need to be worried about, you know, uh, oppression, you know, whether it's women, whether it's different races, whether it's whatever, 
You need to be worried about that. Can you control it? No. So why are you worrying about it? Okay. They're like, well, you know, it's systemic, so you know, you need to do that. No one has ever brought a solution. Okay. You know, everybody's just like, there's systemic racism in America. Well, what's the solution? Do we need to change the law? No, actually, the law is no, there's no law that's actually systemically racist right now. And if anything, you want to go if you want to take it a step further. How about uh, what's what's it called? Uh, um, affirmative action. Affirmative action on women, race, all these different things. Meaning this is that they have to meet a certain quota, and they'll actually bring people into college or into work based off their skin color, even if they have a lower test score. That's actually happening. Okay, so. You're like, oh, I can't believe you'd say that. I, I didn't say it. I didn't make the law. Okay? You're like, oh, you know, are you mad about it? I don't care. Okay? You know what? You know, if, if I lost a job because of that, let's say I was trying to get a job and then affirmative action happened, yeah, I mean, it'd be annoying. But you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to trust God. I'm going to keep his commandments. And guess what? God is going to give me a better job. So, you know what, instead of complaining about the circumstances, why don't you just do what you got to do, okay? And just, just work with what you got to work with. Because can you control affirmative action? And back before affirmative action, when you actually had racist laws like Jim Crow and all these different things where they were segregating people, you know, could, could you as a, a citizen control that? So, you got to be thinking about these type of things. There's obviously wicked things that are going on in the world. There's wicked laws that are passed. I mean, good night, look at all the abortion laws that are out there. And I'm not saying to not speak about it. I'm not saying to not, like, preach the truth and preach it from the housetops, because obviously we should, right, when it comes to sodomy, when it comes to abortion, when it comes to the nuclear family, right, and how they're trying to destroy that. They're trying to tear down fatherhood. They're trying to tear down the idea of, of, of a, a lady, the, the mother staying at home and taking care of the children. They're trying to tear down even having children. And they say, well, you're putting a bigger carbon footprint. Well, take your carbon footprint and, you know, take a hike. You know, go jump in a lake with your carbon footprint. Listen, the cows are doing more than that. Okay. And so in Romans chapter 8 here, this is what you got to remember when you're in a world that's against you, and, and listen, the world is against us, okay? You say you're a Christian, the world is automatically against you. You could say you're any other religion, they'd be like, well, we're for that. But when you're actually for the right religion, when you're actually for the right belief, they all know what that is, okay? Why is it that Christianity is always the one that everybody is against? When it comes to churches opening up, or when it comes to uh, anything dealing with Christianity, it's like, well, you know, you guys are bigoted, but then Islam isn't, okay? Islam's throwing, like, uh, homosexuals off roofs, but, you know, they don't care about that, okay? But if, if you said, if you said Leviticus 2013 in the Bible, then, you know, you're a bigot, and you're, you're evil, you're wicked, okay? So Romans chapter 8 and verse 31, it says this, it says, what shall we say then to the, say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Let that sink in for a second. Jesus Christ, the God of the universe, came down. He was made a little lower than the angels, so that he could, uh, it says, but he was in all, all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Then he was spat on, he was despised, he was rejected, he was beaten, you know, he was mocked, he was crucified, and the sins of the world were put on him. It says, and, and what God is saying here is like, if he did that for you, how will he not give you all, you know, freely give you all things, right? If he spared not his own son. And you think about the love, you know, for, uh, the, uh, um, now I'm forgetting Romans 5, 8, uh, God commended his love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, right? So if he commended his love toward us by dying for us and doing all that for us, how much more shall he freely give us all things? And so you need to put it into perspective. Uh, and keep, keep reading there. It says in verse, uh, verse 34, I'm sorry, verse, verse 33, it says, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. 
Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conqueror, conquerors through him that loved us. So notice that he's basically saying, you know, we're like sheep for the slaughter. But he says, no, in all these things we're more, we're more than conquerors. Okay. And it says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so you need to remember, if God be for us, who can be against us? If God died for us and rose again the third day to pay for all of our sins, and he went through all of that agony for us, you know, how much more shall he be with you in these trials and tribulations you know, and, and be a conqueror through that. Um, and go to, go to Philippians chapter 4, and this is where the, our memory verse for this week comes. So if you're, if, you're, if you're saved today and you're loving God, meaning that you're, you're trying your best to keep his commandments, okay? Because salvation, that's believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. That's he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. That's for, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's just belief, okay? But what we're talking about today is do you want, do you want to live life not worrying? Do you want to live life not fretting about anything? Do you want to live life without having panic attacks and worrying about different things? Well, listen, the prerequisite to getting into that realm is that you love God. And by loving God, you're keeping his commandments. But there's other things that you can do to help with this, okay? Because even if you're keeping God's commandments, that doesn't mean that you're not gonna, your flesh is going to make you worry, okay? What that means is that when you're keeping his commandments and you're doing what you should be doing, that means that God is promising you that he won't let, you know, the wicked win, right? That he's promising, listen, the Bible even says in Revelation chapter 3 that if you keep the word of his patience, that he will keep you from the hour of temptation that's to come upon the whole world. I believe that's a promise from God. And notice in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6, this is our memory verse for the week. It says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, but let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So what does it mean to not be, to be careful for nothing, right? So careful, you can think of like, we say, you know, you're going, you're going on a trip, you're like, well, be careful. That's not what we're talking about, okay? Because careful has to be in a, in a well, we're saying be careful on the road, don't, you know, don't drive fast, you know, be, you know, cautious, right, when it comes to driving. But when it says be careful for nothing, what it's talking about is, is caring for the things of this life, right? Caring for, you know, what's going on in the world right now. And basically it's saying, <clears throat> don't be careful for that type of stuff. Don't put your care on that, okay? But to pray and give supplication unto God. And listen, it says, then the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So what's the opposite of fretting? Having peace, right? So if you don't want to fret, you want to be at peace, Okay, you want to be at rest, okay? Because fretting, worrying, panicking, that's, you're not at rest, right? You're, you're at the opposite of rest. You're, you're, you're tense, right? You're, you're literally losing years off your life, you know, physically because of the worry that you're going through. And the Bible says, you know, don't be careful with that type of stuff. And so when, when it comes to the stuff that's on TV, listen, you just need to shut that stuff off, okay? I'm not saying you don't, don't be informed about anything, Okay, but you know what people do is they just watch it and 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 that's all they're thinking about. And if that's all I was thinking about, yeah, life would suck. <laughs> you know, if I was just, if I just thought about what the news wanted me to think about, I mean, listen, there's shootings and killings every single day. And so do you want to just know about all that stuff all the time? Okay, and, and can you control it? 
you know, you can't control it. And so you don't want to be, you don't want to be naive and you don't want to be like, like an ostrich, you know, where you don't know about anything that's going on, but you don't also want to just be like, just that's all you think about, that's all you, you look at, right? Well, keep reading there because it's going to give you some advice. Now, I believe the Bible is giving you advice on how you don't worry and how you don't fret, okay? Verse 8, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. So notice what it's saying. All right, all those things that are what? True, honest, just. Well, you've just gotten everything in the news out. <laughs> Listen, I've never, every news article that's out there has a twist to it, has a bias to it. Every national news that I've ever seen, when I've actually known who was involved in it, and then I hear the story, I'm like, yeah, that's not right. That's not accurate. Everybody that I've ever talked to that's been in the news or had something going on, they're like, yeah, they messed that up. They didn't give that accurately. And so I don't trust a thing that's on the news, okay? There's always a little bit of truth, but there's a little bit of, uh, there's good food and rat poison, okay? So, but it says that think on these things. Notice that what's a good report? What's another way of saying good report? Good news, <laughs> okay? So what's on the news most of the time? Bad news. It's always bad news because that's what draws you in. You know, most of the time they're not talking about like the t-ball game that's going on down the street, you know, and they're like, oh, you know, Johnny got a, got a home run. You know, that doesn't, that doesn't bring up ratings. I'm sure the parents love to see that, okay? But that's not what you see on the news. It's always doom and gloom. It's always, you know, like basically everything's falling apart. The economy's falling apart. Everybody hates each other. There's death. There's murder. You know, there's all this stuff that's going on. And you know what the Bible says? You shouldn't be putting your mind on those things, right? It says in Philippians that those things, think on these things. Think on, you know, what's good, what's honest, what's true, what's just, what's a good report, what's lovely, okay? Think about what news report have you seen that's like, that's lovely. Could you think of one? where you looked at a news report and that's lovely. That's a lovely news report right there. I can't think of one. No, not one, <laughs> right? And so, you know what the Bible's saying here? Don't think on those things. I'm not saying you're not going to see it and all that. You know what you shouldn't be doing is dwelling about it. Because all it's going to make you is angry. It's going to make you fret. It's going to make you worry. And then, you know, you're just messing up your life, you know? And especially when you have kids because your kids don't know anything that's going on. And I want to keep it that way. You know, I don't want my kids to have to know what's going on in the world. Right? When this coronavirus thing went around and they're like, why can't we go to the park? I'm like, well, people are dumb, you know. I don't understand why the parks are closed. <laughs> it's true. It's so stupid. Listen, you know, obviously the coronavirus, I'm not saying it's not a real thing. And I'm not saying that obviously we took some precautions and all that stuff when it was, when it was uh, supposed to be the, the hype week or the height of the... the the coronavirus, but some of this stuff just did not make sense. You're closing down the, the trails. You can't walk outside and breathe fresh air. No, we need to breathe everybody's air in our house, you know, and uh, that makes sense. But I don't want my kids to worry about it. I want them to be like, listen, the economy is going to be taking a plunge. So, you know, we may not, we may not be able to eat that. Uh, we may not be able to have ice cream cones for a little while. And, uh, you know, just like bringing it down to their level. Like, I'm not going to say anything about that. You know, and it, like we almost didn't go to the, to the beach because the beaches were closed down and all that stuff. And we had to explain to him, you know, stuff's closed down, but we're going to reschedule and all that. And, uh, but you know, all these riots are going on. You know, my kids know nothing about that. Like, I'm not talking to my kids like, yeah, they're burning down everything. It's just, I'm scared. I'm scared about what's going on in our country. Well, thank God we're in West Virginia because, you know, it's not happening here, okay? We, they had some protests, but it wasn't, like, anything uh, malicious. Then now they tried to bust people in from out of state, and they nipped that in the bud real quick. And so 
Um, but all that to say is that, you know, we're kind of in an oasis here in West Virginia <laughs> to where I don't really have to explain that to them. We're not going downtown and people are like trying to pull people out. Well, first of all, if they did that in West Virginia, they would die. Okay. Anybody who tries to come into my car or my van when my kids are in there, or if I'm just in there, um, then they're going to get shot. And I think people know that, and, you know, like that's why they're not doing it in West Virginia or in Arizona <laughs> or in Texas, right? You see this stuff happening in uh, gun-free zones, like all the big cities, okay? So if anything, people should be waking up to it. But all I say is that, you know, first of all, I don't need to explain it to them because it's not even happening around us. But second of all, even if it was happening around us, you know what I would do? I would shield them from that. So they don't need to be worrying about that. They should be worrying about what princess outfit they're going to wear on and what tea party they're going to have with their little dolls, right? You know, that's the type of the stuff that they should be worrying about. And, <clears throat> but if you, if you were to get that point, you know what's going to happen? You're going to come home and they're going to see it in your countenance, right? They're going to see that you're worried, right? So what you need to do is you need to put off that garbage. You need to come home and, and just be, you know, happy with your kids and, and you know, not let them think that you're worried. And, and I'm not saying that you couldn't worry about work and you, obviously things happen and you're like, how am I going to get by? But I don't ever come up to my kids and be like, we're really strapped this month. Like, how are we going to make it? And you're like, does that happen to you? All the time. <laughs> you know, I mean, everybody deals with that, I think. Okay, maybe some of you are just really good with your finances and nothing ever bad happens. Your full washer doesn't break or your car doesn't die or whatever. <laughs> but I think everybody deals with that to where there's something that happens. You're like, I wasn't planning for that, <laughs> you know? And so you're just like, how am I going to make it? How am I going to get by? But listen, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And, and also, like I said, don't be thinking about those things. If you think about those things, guess what? it's going to bring you down, okay? And, you know, set your affections on things above and not things on the earth. That's what it says in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 2, okay? Go to Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6. Because I think in a lot of this stuff, you think about what's going to happen in the future, okay? What's going to happen, um, you know, in a year from now? What's going to happen in July, right? It's like every month there's some crazy thing happening. Listen, just mark it down that it's going to be crazy and weird until November. This isn't a conspiracy, my friends. You know what? It's, it's an election year, and people want their power, and they are doing everything they can to basically make everything crumble. And I'm not here to, like, promote President Trump here, but let's just be honest. You know, all the, the patronizing garbage that's going on, by all both sides, even the Republican Party is doing this to try to appease implacable people. And so, listen, just mark it down. It's going to be crazy. It's going to be weird. Um, you know, they're going to have. I wouldn't. I wouldn't be surprised if they're like, well, Area 51 has aliens, and you know, not that it's true, but you know, they're going to basically something's going to come out to make it sound like we're all going to die. Okay. But listen, you know what the Bible says is that springtime, summer or seed time, summer, harvest, winter, none of those things are ever going to change. And listen, that stuff that's going to happen in the end times, that's going to happen. So the, the idea that, that an asteroid is going to hit and that the earth is just going to explode or that the sun's going to make the earth explode, you know, you get these things and people are actually worried about it. Or that, you know, global warming and climate change, that's going to, that's going to, we're all going to die. Listen, that's not going to happen. You're like, oh, how do you know that? You're a science denier. <laughs> well, first of all, the Bible says it's not going to happen. I believe God's word. Second of all, your science is flawed. Okay? You're working off of like 100 or 200 years of information, and you're going to tell me that, that you know what's been going on for the last thousands of years, let alone they believe in millions of years. Good night. You know, if, if man's been on the earth for 500,000 years, according to them, then how in the world do they know what the climate was back then? You know, it could have been way warmer back then. Maybe that's what killed the dinosaurs, right? Heat wave. Anyway, all that to say, I know that's being silly, but what I'm saying is that, um, you know what, I don't worry about that stuff because I know certain things can't happen because I know what the end of the book says, okay? And as Christians, guess what? Do you believe in the Bible? Then that's what you should be thinking too, is that, well, I know that, 
God says that those seasons will never end. God says that these certain things have to happen, so that means that we're not going to get wiped out by an asteroid or like some crazy event's going to happen. Like, oh, the whole flood. There's actually a movie, I think Leonardo DiCaprio put out about the flood, right? That there's going to be this worldwide flood because all the ice caps melt. Well, God said he'd never flood the earth again. So good luck with that. Good luck. Okay? Now, your beachfront property may get taken out. But you know what? Maybe West Virginia will have beachfront property. So it's time to cash in on the cheap West Virginia property, right? You know, get that stuff by the... By the hillside, you know, you may end up having beachfront property eventually. So you got to look at the bright side. There's always a silver lining. Okay. So here in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Notice what it says here. It says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. And this is what you really should be thinking about. It's not saying, like, don't think about the, the future as far as, like, we can't plan a soul winning marathon because the Bible says don't take thought for tomorrow, <laughs> okay? What this is talking about is don't worry about the t tomorrow, right? Don't worry about the evils that are going to come tomorrow, okay? That's the context, okay? Because he just got done saying, listen, you know, he clothed the grass and the field. You know, he's going to give you food and raiment, okay? And so don't worry about those type of things, you know, Today is enough. Today is enough to worry about. And like I said, those things on the morrow that you're worried about may never even come. And how many times has that happened? Where you've just been worried about something, worried about something, and it never came. You're like, man, I wasted my time worrying about that. When it comes to persecution, there's been times where our church has been under persecution. I've been under persecution for what I preached. And you can worry about it. And listen, you know, there's times where I've worried about it. It's like, well, am I going to lose my job? Is, my, is this going to happen? You know, what, how far will they take these threats? And it's more so the fact that I think about my kids, and I don't want my kids to have to deal with that garbage, okay? And you worry about that stuff, and then nothing happens, and you're like, well, that was dumb to even think about worrying about that. But it's just normal human response to things that would happen. But don't take thought for tomorrow. And, you know, and he says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. You say, well, how am I going to make, you know, ends meet? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. You're like, so that means that I could just stop working and do that? No, because if you don't work, neither should you eat, okay? But if you're working hard and doing what God tells you to do, and by the way, doing what God tells you to do is working hard, okay? And providing for your family, because he that provided not for his own, especially for those of his own household, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel, okay? So there's your commandment that you're supposed to be doing there. So if you're doing that, though, Listen, he'll, all this will be added unto you. So you don't have to worry about food and raiment. It's going to come. Because the Bible says in Psalm 37, right? It's a Psalm 37, verse 25. It says, I have, been old, I have been young, and now I'm old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. He is ever merciful and lendeth, and his seed is blessed. So David's saying, listen, I was young, I've been old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. And say, well, you know, we could all get into hard times. Listen, if you're loving God and keeping his commandments, guess what? You're going to be in church. And the whole church isn't going to be hurting at the same time. And let's say, the whole, let's say you had a Great Depression or something like that, and the whole church was hurting. Guess what? God's going to step in. And he's going to be like Elijah, you know, where he's going to send you ravens and send you food, okay? But all that to say is not everybody's hurting at the same time. So let's, let's say a family was hurting. Guess what? The church is going to step up and take care of that family because you're not going to be out begging bread. Listen, it, it, we'll all be down there with you if you were begging bread, okay? But guess what? We sh it will never happen, okay? Do you believe this verse when it says that, that he will not forsake the righteous and that his seed will not beg bread? That means that we will not be begging bread if you're keeping his commandments. If you're loving God, guess what? You will not beg for bread. I don't care if it's a great tribulation. It doesn't say except for the Great Tribulation, okay? <laughs> so, you know what the Bible says? I believe that applies to the Great Tribulation. I believe it applies when it says that if you keep his word and of his patience unto the end, that he will keep you from the hour of temptation. I believe that if you're keeping his commandments and loving God in the Great Tribulation, you will be there to say, and lift up your head and look up for your redemption draweth nigh, and you'll be there to stand and see the Lord Jesus coming in the clouds. 
Now, some people won't accept deliverance because they want a better resurrection, okay? So some people will be like, you know what? I'm going to take the better resurrection. I'm going to be a martyr for Christ, okay? And you could have that option too, okay? But I don't, I don't believe that, that he's going to forsake us at all if you're keeping his commandments, even in those times. Actually, especially in those times, okay? Because that's where God gets the most glory is when you have zero power. You know, there's no doubt that God intervenes in those cases. Um, how about James chapter 4? James chapter 4 dealing with the, tom- uh, with the morrow, okay? Because with all this stuff that's going on, all you can think about is what's going to happen tomorrow? What's going to happen next month? You know, is everything just going to crumble next month? It just seems like everything is just so fragile right now. Would anyone have thought that in 2020, like, everything would just be falling apart like it is, okay? But let me ask you a question. Do you really think it's falling apart? Or do they want you to think it's falling apart? Because you know what? I work, and you know what? Nothing's changed in my work. <laughs> I've actually been more busy. I've been, is that, a, is that the right way to say it? More busy? Busier? <laughs> I is an engineer, okay? So <laughs> I've been busier since the coronavirus and since all this stuff has been going on. And so, to me, if, you, if I never saw the news, never saw what was going on, I have no idea that there was, like, some economic downturn or something was going on, okay? Now, that doesn't mean that that's the way it is for everybody, okay? But they want you to think that everything's just collapsing. Listen, they're still building stuff. They're still doing all kinds of, you know, like, everybody's still working, you know, as far as people that, I, I think right now, anyway. I don't know if there's anybody that's still out, like, not working at all. Um, but all to say, they want you to think that everything is just crashed. No, you know, everybody's just falling apart. Everybody's just running around like, what are we going to do? You know, that's why sometimes it's good to get, get out and talk to people. Okay? Because if you get into a bubble where you're just like watching the news and doing all this stuff, and I feel like when we go out soul winning, that's sometimes the things that we see is people are literally haven't left their house in like three months. And they're like, and they, they see you come to the door, they're like, oh, there's people. It's like, do you think we're in an apocalypse? Like, like, uh, you know, what, what do you think is going on right now? And um, so they close themselves off and they worry and they fret. And if they just went out and talked to people, they'd realize, you know what, it really isn't that bad right now. And same thing when it comes to this racial divide that's going on right now and everything that's trying to be pushed. If you just went out and talked to people, you realize that it's, it's not what they'd say it is. Okay? That most people aren't stupid. They're not bigots. And listen, if you are a racist, you're an idiot. Okay. If you think that the color of someone's skin changes the cost of tea in China, then you're a moron. And you're like, oh, I can't believe you call someone. I would call them a moron to their face if they ever said anything like that. And so, uh, but that's, but th- I believe that that's what most people think, right? I think most people believe that. I think most people are in that realm. And you always have the outliers, and you always have those people on the outside that are, are just ignorant on things. But um, in, in James chapter 4 and verse 13, it says, Go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and, and continue there in a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. The Bible says in Proverbs 27, verse 1, it says, Boast not thyself for, of, the, of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. And it's basically saying you don't know what's going to be on the morrow. Right? So why worry about it? You know, so Jesus is saying, you know, take no thought for the morrow because sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Meaning that you got enough to worry about today as far as what's going on right now. So don't worry about tomorrow because you don't know what's on the morrow. You don't even know if you're going to be here tomorrow. And listen, you say, well, you know, that worries me. Well, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I what not. For I'm in a straight betwixt two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, abide in the flesh is more needful for you. I don't know about you, but if I died, I'm better off, <laughs> okay? You're the ones that have to suffer, you know? So if I die, you know, it's more so on everybody else that has to continue here, okay? So you need to know that, hey, we're ri- willing, rather, to be absent from the body and be present with the Lord. When you have that attitude, do you really care that if you die tomorrow? Now, the only thing that I would think about with that is that my children, right? I think about them being taken care of, okay? So that would be my only thing holding me back from saying I'd rather be with Christ, okay? And so where's your mindset? What are you thinking about? 
You know, if you're thinking about the things of God, then, you know, all this other stuff's going to kind of fade away. Okay. And go to Mark chapter 1. The last thing I want to mention here. So, first of all, you shouldn't worry about things you can't control. Don't be thinking about, don't, putting, don't be putting your mind on all these things in the world, you know, what they want you to think about. The Bible says, think on the things that are pure and honest and true and just and lovely and of good report. Think on those things and do them. And the God of peace will be with you. And the peace of God that passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So, you know what, if, you, if you're thinking about those things, you're doing those things, sooner, sooner or later you're going to be like, I, I forgot about that. You know what, I forgot about the coronavirus a long time ago, like a, a little while back. I, I, the only thing it reminds me is when I had to go put on a mask to go into a store or something like that, or get my hair cut, or whatever, you know, the case may be. I, I almost just forget about it. I'm like, oh yeah, that is going on, isn't it? You know, <laughs> and, and, or there'll be a news article or something will come up and be like, oh yeah, I guess that is going on over there. Um, but in Mark chapter 1, Jesus is healing a lot of people and obviously doing these miracles and everything. And in verse 32 here it says, And at, at even, when the sun did set, they brought unto him all that were diseased and them that were possessed with devils. And all the city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many that were sick of diverse diseases and cast out many devils and suffered not the devils to speak because they knew him. Now, so basically what's going on? He's doing a lot of work. Right? He's, and he's seeing a lot of crazy stuff, if you imagine. I mean, he's casting out devils, and it's not exactly, I, don't, I wouldn't call that pleasurable work right there. Okay? You're dealing with demon-possessed people and all that. But notice in verse 35, it says, And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into, notice what it says here, a solitary place, and there prayed. You know, when there's times of trouble and like, and let's say you're in anxiety or, or, or whatever, you really just need to separate yourself with the Lord. Okay? You need to get into that solitary place. And go to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. And this is the last point I really want to make here is that, you know what, when everything is hitting like this, you know what you need to do? You just need to turn everything off, get alone with the Lord. You need to pray to Him, right? Casting all your care upon Him for He careth for you. So if you're being careful about a lot of things that you shouldn't be careful about, if you're caring for a lot of things that you shouldn't be caring about, you should say, Lord, take that. And let, let's say, well, I'm worried about my children. Well, cast all your care upon him. Put that on him. You know, when it comes to my children's safety, obviously I'm prepared. Okay? I'm prepared to do whatever it takes to, to, to protect my children, provide for my children. But ultimately, you know what I do? As I put it on the Lord, I say, Lord, I'm, I'm trusting you. Because I'm not there all the time. So I put it on the Lord and say, Lord, I'm trusting you. Take care of my children. I know you'll do it. And I put it on him. And is there anybody more faithful to put it on? Do you really think, I mean, if you really think about it, if you ask God to take care of your children, do you think that he's going to be like, yeah, I think I can do that? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? And if you're keeping God's commandments and you say, well, but some things happen to people and different things happen like that. Listen, I, I understand that. And sometimes we don't see the bigger picture, right? Because sometimes he does take away people because of evil to come, okay? But I, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you this. I do not believe that if you love the Lord and you're keeping God's commandments and you're asking God to take care of your children, that he will not let someone kidnap your children. He will not let someone molest or hurt your children like that if you are doing what you should be doing and you're trusting in the Lord. And that's what I believe. Okay, you say, well, you know, I, in this case over here, listen, I'm sticking to the guns that, that, that God will take care of my children and that he won't let me down. He hasn't let me down yet, so I am trusting in that. And that's how I have peace at night. Because there's a lot of wicked, weird, wicked people in the world. And so I'm not naive to that. But I also don't just dwell on that, think about that, and worry about that all day. If I did, I'd be sick to my stomach every single day. Okay. So you have to put that on the Lord and say, Lord, you know, you're gonna, you need to take that. Now, I'm going to kind of give you the synopsis here. 1 Kings chapter 19, this is where, this is right after uh, Elijah destroys all the prophets of Baal. So you remember the story where the prophets of Baal bring their sacrifice, they're supposed to call down fire, they can't do it. And then he calls down fire from the Lord, and then he goes and kills all the prophets of Baal. Jezebel doesn't like it, so Jezebel is basically saying that, 
he's, he, she's going to make sure that Elijah is like one of those prophets, meaning that she's going to kill him. Okay? So he flees into the wilderness. In verse 4 there it says, But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. So this is Elijah that just prayed that it wouldn't rain for three and a half years, and it, at this point still hadn't rained. Or no, I'm sorry, it just started raining at the end of chapter 18. And he, uh, he was heal, healing people and doing these miracles with, like, uh, you know, feeding people and all this stuff. And then he calls down fire from heaven, and all this stuff is going on, right? And then he comes into this state where they're after him. You know, he's in trouble, and he's like, just take me, just kill me. Okay, so he's at a low spot, right? I would say he's pretty worried, okay? But he's alone in the wilderness. He, sa- he basically isolates himself to be with the Lord there. And notice in verse, um, verse 9 of chapter 19, it says, And he came therefore, or I'm sorry, he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said unto him, what, dost thou, uh, what doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with, with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, a, left, and they seek my life to take it away. So Elijah is obviously loving the Lord, doing what he should be doing. Does that make sense? He's saved, but he's also doing what he should be doing. He's doing great works for God. It says, and he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the, fu- but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering of the cave and behold there came a voice unto him and said what dost thou what doest thou here Elijah and the, the, the key is, is that the word of God was coming to him in this cave right God was speaking to him see prayer is where you're talking to God right you're asking God for things but this is where God talks to you okay so what you need to do is like Jesus did he, he brought himself out to a solitary place right and he'd just been doing a lot of work right he, he if you imagine all the work that he did, that, that, that's going to be vexing on the flesh, right? You're just going to be tired and mentally tired, all these different things, right? And he goes into a solitary pr- place to pray. What does Elijah do? He flees into the wilderness and goes to, he's literally just hanging out underneath a juniper tree. Then he goes into a cave. And the key I want you to see here is that you need to quiet everything down. Because if you're going to st- hear that still, small voice, you need to just get everything quieted down, right? Because if you've ever been really worried about something or just everything's going on, your mind's going a million miles an hour, and then you try to read the Bible, it's hard because you can't concentrate. What you need to do is just put all that stuff out and just really just let the Bible speak to you. You've got to calm down. You've got to get quiet and just get into that and just put everything outside. Get, get your phone out of your face. You know, get everything out of, out of the room where you're at, whatever it takes, just to get to that point. And you say, well, I have kids. Jesus went a great while before day. And you're like, does that mean I need to wake up at 4, 4 a.m.? Well, Brother Dave wakes up at 2 a.m., so he, he'd say, well, that's, that's late. <laughs> so, but, you know, if it has to be so, then let it be so, okay? But you need to get that quiet time with the Lord. This is where you're going to not worry. Okay? This is where you're going to put off that fretting and that anxiety and that panic is when you just let the Lord just softly talk to you through his word. And there is something just so comfort- comforting about God's word. And I don't care what passage it is. It could be Genesis, 3, Genesis 19. It could be any passage in the Bible, and it's comforting because it's God's word. I mean, you'd be like, well, that's a rough passage. Yeah, but that's God's judgment that's coming there. So you could always think about like, well, that's comforting because you know that, hey, wickedness isn't going to be tolerated with God. 
and that God is a God of judgment, and that he's not just going to let injustice go by. But then you could just be reading about the Psalms, and you could be reading different things where it's just a comforting passage. The Bible says in Psalm 119, in verse 165, it says, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Great peace have they which love thy, thy law. So if you love God's word, and you're just getting down into this solitary place where you're reading it and listening to what God has to say. And some, that's just hard to do. That doesn't always happen. Just because you're reading the Bible doesn't mean that you're actually listening to what's being said. Sometimes you can just be going through the motions. Have you ever read a chapter and be like, I don't even know what I just read. Did I actually even just read that chapter? This can happen with anything that you're reading. But what it is is that you're not focusing on what's being said. And but they're, they're, and you say, well, you know, it's just not working. Read it until it does. I don't care how long it takes. There's going to come a point where you're just like, all right, I'm listening to you now. <laughs> right? I'm listening to you. And it's going to give you the peace of God that passes all understanding. And you won't know that unless you try it. Okay? So what do you do to not fret? Well, you need to love, you need to be saved, first of all. <laughs> You need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, be saved, but you need to love God. That means that you need to be doing what he's telling you to do, keeping his commandments. And now, hey, he's, all these promises are added to you that, hey, all things are going to work together for good. You know, he, he's not going to suffer you to be begging bread. All these different things are going to be applying to you at that point. But then on your part, you need to say, okay, I'm going to not be thinking and caring about all these things that the world wants me to care about. Right? I'm not going to care about that. I'm going to cast that all on God. And then I'm going to think about what's good and lovely and true and honest and just. So you say, well, you know, there's injustice going on in the world. Well, think about the fact that there will be justice going on in the world. Think about the fact that Jesus is going to come and he's going to roll with a rod of iron and justice will be on this earth eventually. So that's comforting. It's comforting to know, hey, this isn't forever. You know, for all eternity, God is going to be ruling and reigning and we're going to have peace and justice for all eternity. What is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. If you really think about it, what is, what is 6,300 years in, in eternity when it comes to the injustices and all that stuff that's going on right now? What is that compared to eternity of complete justice and peace with a benevolent dictator, which is our Savior? You know, that's the type of stuff that is going to give you hope. And also the fact that the Bible says in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and verse 3, it says, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. So God is the, the God of all comfort. And so what's the opposite of, of fretting? Being in comfort, right? Being in peace, okay? And God is not calling us to just be worried about everything, you know? So, you know, you, sometimes you'll... You, I, I believe our church is pretty happy, right? You know, you come to our church, we're pretty, we're pretty jolly. And, and the world's falling apart around us, right? But you know what? You come here and we're happy. Why? Because we're saved. We're doing what God is telling us to do. We're seeing people saved every single week. We're seeing people, you know, like just growing in the Lord. We're reading our Bibles. We're doing all this stuff. Why should we be worried about everything that's going on when we have, a, you know, a great Savior, a great God, and he's going to set everything right one day? Because we're looking, we're setting our sights on things above and our affections on things above and not on the earth. You know what? And, it, and you say, well, yeah, I've been kind of worrying about that stuff. Turn off CNN. I don't know why you're watching that anyway. Turn off CNN. Turn off Fox. Turn off MSNBC. Turn off you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, whatever all those stations are, you know, turn all that garbage off and you know what? Turn this on right here. Not that, this. <laughs> turn this on right here. And you say, I'm still worried. Then turn it on more. I don't care if you're reading it, if you have to read it four hours in a sitting, turn this on until that still small voice, until you quiet everything down, until you can't think about anything else but what the Bible's saying. And you know what, sometimes I can really tell who's reading their Bible a lot because that's what's on their mind on everything that they're saying. They're like, I was just reading this the other day. I was reading this, you know, what do you think about this? You're reading this. Why? Because that's what you're thinking about. And so set your mind on that stuff. Mind those things. 
mind not carnal things, mind not the things of the world, mind the things of the, of the Lord, and get into the Bible, and you know, don't fret, don't worry, don't panic, okay? Now, I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not here to say, like, I know everybody's situations and, like, how to deal with every single situation when some pe people are dealing with panic attacks, okay? But ultimately, the Bible, when it, comes to, when it comes to anxiety, when it comes to panic, when it comes to depression. And I know I preached a sermon on depression not too long ago, mm -hmm. but a lot of these things, hey, you know what? If we're loving God, keeping his commandments, and you know what? If we're, if we're just in the Bible and letting God really talk to us, it puts a lot of stuff in perspective. And so, um, fret not, a.k.a. don't be worried. <laughs> so, let's end with a word for today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. And thank you for, again for all the souls that were saved. Thank you for everybody that came out and participated. And thank you for our church. And Lord, just pray that you'd help us, especially in these perilous times, that we don't worry about things that we can't control and that we don't, uh, we don't, we're not careful about all these different things, but that we put that on you. And Lord, just thank you again uh, for, for salvation. Uh, and Lord, we love you and pray also in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.